And yeah, as uh, the title of the talk today uh, implies, we're going to be talking about technology transfer um, and low carbon energy. Um, and this is based on a paper that I am writing together with Andreas Godtau um, about energy initiatives for the global south. Um, I won't go through this because you guys know what the MOPCA initiative is and uh, that we're working at the ISS um, on basically um, the systemic impacts of the energy transition and we're quite interested in the political and economic implications. Um, so when we started out this research, um, we were really interested in the international politics of low carbon technology transfer um, because there was a lot of discussion going on at the UNFCCC um, and other arenas that technology transfer is really important. Um, and so the first question is kind of why? Why do we care so much about low carbon technology industries? Um, and basically, uh, we're running from the first assumption that future energy systems are going to be based mostly around renewable energy, um, electrification. Of course, there will be other important technologies too, but the backbone of these systems are going to be solar, wind, uh, hydro, and all of the other technologies that make us able to run energy systems around them. Um, and this is a really uh, profitable industry. It's going to be a trillion dollar market. Um, and right now innovation is, or innovation activities are basically concentrated in OECD countries um, as well as China. Uh, and in other countries, there's some relatively uh, limited investment in renewables. So this um, is kind of old numbers, sorry, but um, the, general trends remain the same, that basically developing countries see a very, very low share of uh, finance and also a very low share of uh, technology ownership and innovation activities um, in the renewable energy sphere. And so this is what we're calling um, kind of in this paper and in this branch of research, uh, the low carbon technology gap, that basically there's um, some very unequal distributions of finance and technology. Um, so why is that a problem? And why are we talking about it in the international community? Um, so there's one really big issue that has come up at the UNFCCC, at the World Trade Organization, the WTO, which is the issue of justice and historical responsibility. So as we all know, um, emissions are mostly generated in the global north and they will be uh, yeah, harming uh, people in the global south, already are harming people in the global south. Um, and so this raises very significant justice concerns. Um, and we've seen a sort of north-south division in international negotiations around um, climate and technology, where basically um, there are different interests um, from different country groups. So um, many countries are, uh, or many negotiators are saying that there needs to be a bigger focus on development um, given this uh, historical responsibility. Um, whereas some other countries are saying we need to diffuse low carbon technologies as quickly as possible to avoid the catastrophic effects of uh, climate change. Um, and so along these lines, we've seen also calls from developing countries to put technologies um, into the public domain so that there, anybody can um, build any kind of low carbon technology. Um, and also to improve the funding and the structures for technology transfer. Mm. And so these have been ongoing debates since the mid 2000s. Um, and basically the outcomes, uh, the structure as we have it right now um, is that we have the conditionally, uh, conditional nationally determined contributions to the Paris Agreement where many countries um, have, made, have made their goals conditional on receiving international support. Um, and developed countries are meant to provide uh, investment, they're meant to provide also technology transfer and capacity building. Um, and most developing countries have conditional NDCs where they say they're, they're um, going to need um, technology transfer. So the image that you see here is um, how many NDCs are uh, conditional on technology transfer. Um, and the UN also has its tech transfer mechanism, which is meant to sort of facilitate these processes. Um, so I think before we keep going, it's important to have a definition of what I'm talking about here when I say technology transfer. Um, and so it's more than just technology moving from point A to point B, somebody in a new location using a solar panel. Technology transfer, um, this holistic definition that the IPCC uses is the process of learning to understand, 
utilize and replicate a technology um, and also adapt it to local conditions and integrate it with indigenous technologies. Um, Technology diffusion is when a hardware is basically just used in a new location. And of course, this is really important. Um, technology transfer is when local knowledge and skills are increasing. Um, and this is sort of the, the key problem is that there's higher development and long-term emissions reduction potential that are associated with technology transfer. Um, so that's a very important goal for governments in many developing countries. Um, the research on low carbon tech transfer uh, from my uh, look through it is very focused on success stories and the role of federal, uh, for, sorry, foreign direct investment and trade. Um, and China here is pointed to as a real example of how a country can build up um, solar and wind industry uh, based on technology transfer and cooperation. Um, other countries have attempted to sort of follow in China's footsteps and um, build their own indigenous industries. Um, this has worked somewhat in certain places. So for example, Chile and Brazil are named in the literature as very important um, as technology transfer playing a role in the development of these industries. Um, there's a pretty high demand as well as a pre-existing pre -existing knowledge base and policy. Um, India is also named as an example. Um, the clean development mechanism is quite important here. Um, however, there's some debates in the literature as to whether India is really um, seen as the sort of the technology periphery um, and suggestions that it's kind of late to the game. Um, and the other, the other main thing that the literature focuses on is the clean development mechanism. Um, and so this, uh, partly I think because this is where people can get data, um, it's quite hard to get data on technology transfer. Um, and what researchers find is that tech transfer through the CDM basically already followed existing relationships and existing trends. Um, so it wasn't resulting in a kind of, um, yeah, a, a redistribution um, of, of finances and know-how. Most of the projects were uh, in India, China, and Brazil. Very few projects were in Africa. Um, and also those scholars that looked in depth at technology transfer that was listed in the projects found that it's not necessarily tech transfer per se, it's often actually just diffusion. Um, and so some other scholars have suggested that South-South exchange is one way that um, we could see um, more technology transfer to the global south. Um, and especially these uh, existing imbalances um, could make this kind of more appropriate. Um, the case studies that I've found on this basically say that it's less important where it comes from and the power relationships are a bit more what's important. So um, China, for example, is um, active in building new um, energy generation projects elsewhere, but again, um, not necessarily transferring technology. Um, so what we're interested in is looking at how smaller developing countries can address this technology gap. Um, and I'm kind of, I'm structuring this around sort of two parts today. I wanna to talk about first, um, why markets don't deliver, why they haven't delivered so far, why not every country can follow in China's footsteps, um, and then alternative mechanisms, the role of technology transfer initiatives um, in promoting clean tech transfer and the kind of scope and coverage that they have. Um, all right, so tech transfer in theory. Um, as you can see, uh, this is a very like a preliminary model of what it could look like, um, it's based on Aqua et al. Um, and so, the different actors you have here are the technology supplier and the technology importer. Um, and so the technology supplier has a lot of different um, capacities. They have engineering and managerial capacities. Um, and the technology importer um, can receive these different technology streams. Um, so the first stream uh, of technology that's transferred is uh, goods, services, and designs. Um, and that can lead to new production capacity. Um, the second flow is uh, the flow of skills and know-how, which can also lead to new production capacity. Um, and the third way that technology moves uh, from point A to point B is 
knowledge and expertise can also be transferred. Um, and this is what allows for the accumulation of technological capacity by importers. Um, so flow C here, um, the flow of knowledge and expertise is what allows a technology importer to potentially catch up to other firms, to the technology suppliers. Um, but it's also where technological, uh, where technology suppliers get their competitive advantages from. Um, so if we believe in um, capitalism and the way it works per se, you don't want to necessarily give up your competitive advantage, what makes you uh, have your innovative edge, so to speak. But as we know from the literature, many countries want to accumulate technological capacity. Um, they want to build industries around this. So this is sort of the fundamental conflict that we see um, coming into play. So um, I'm just taking the example of the solar photovoltaic technology um, from the literature on technology transfer. Um, and basically we see um, many uh, EU firms having a kind of first mover advantage here um, as technology suppliers. Um, when they started manufacturing uh, more solar panels in China, um, the flow of flow C of knowledge and expertise um, eventually led to China becoming a leader in manufacturing and installment and now in uh, research and development. Um, however, this accumulation of technological capacity appears to mostly be in China and a lot of developing countries use but don't produce um, these technologies. Um, and so I'm also, uh, I want to think this through with you guys, um, sort of how it works in practice and how the different flows work and why this matters for politics. Um, and so I'm taking the example of Jordan because that's something that I've been looking at a bit as one of the case studies of um, energy transformations around the world. Um, and so there's a, I'm taking this example of a very large wind farm that's um, been built in Jordan um, and it's operated by Orsted. So that's the technology supplier and the technology importer is the Jordanian government. Um, and so if you think about the different kinds of ways that the technology might move from Orsted to this location in Jordan, the first flow would be the wind turbines, right? The, the hardware, like what's actually being installed locally. Um, and so we see this happening um, and this, there's a lot more wind power now in the Jordanian energy mix, which is great for them, decarbonization, um, energy security. Um, then there's flow B, which would be um, maybe training locals to be able to operate and maintain these wind turbines. Um, and so the benefits of this for Jordan would be not only having more wind power in the energy mix, but also having some new technological capacities, being able to really um, keep up these, uh, this wind farm. Um, and then flow C would be the knowledge and expertise. So how are these turbines built? Um, how do you run them really effectively? Um, and if Jordanian firms were able to accumulate this capacity, maybe they could um, build their own equipment or run their own wind farms. Um, and so again, this is where the real catching up potential lies. And this is also where the competitive advantage of the technology supplier lies. Um, so it's clearly not in the interest of Orsted to just give away for free what they've spent a lot of money and time developing. Um, so let's break it down into the different kinds of technology transfer um, and the benefits for countries, um, as well as the benefits for firms. So technology transfer flow A, um, this is generally uh, seen in very attractive markets. So markets that are stable, that are profitable, that are large, um, of which Jordan is one. Um, and so the technology supplier has the advantage of entering a new market, um, gaining revenue. Um, the importer has the benefit of having a new energy source. Um, they may have the benefit of land rents. Um, this is actually quite low in a lot of cases um, because <laughs> at least in the case of Jordan, um, it's uh, very minimal. Um, there are also some new low skill jobs. So maybe in construction, maybe in cleaning. Um, the problem here is sometimes that um, there's not the possibility to do operation and uh, maintenance stuff locally um, or adapt it to the conditions. And also, if you build a wind farm in a location where you didn't pay very much for the land and you only hired people for a very short amount of time, 
um, or maybe to do some cleaning, um, there is also this potential for a, a sort of social backlash. Um, so who gets left out of flow A? Um, it's a not inconsiderate, <laughs> or uh, it's a not in, uh, it's not a small number of countries, let's just say that. Um, so basically, I've showed you this before, but um, you can see that investments in renewable energy are mostly not in small developing countries. Um, the literature says this is generally, um, if there's political or economic instability or unattractive electricity markets, that could mean relatively low demand or um, bad infrastructure. Um, so the potential solutions to increase this first flow of technology would be generally increasing the attractiveness of investing in these places. So de-risking demand aggregation, maybe improving infrastructure. Um, generally, that's the long and slow process. Um, and of course, we need decarbonization of energy systems to happen quickly. Um, so also more funding for international mechanisms that can help support here would be really important. Um, all right, so flow B would be um, sharing some skills and some training. Um, so in this case, that would be if a company builds a wind farm in Jordan and then hires the locals to operate and maintain it. Um, and there are benefits here, again, for being able to fix it if something goes wrong. Um, so when does this happen? Which countries are included? So in general, um, locals have to have pretty good skills for this to take place, uh, especially for operation and maintenance. Um, and also there has to be um, not a very high risk of losing control of value creation. So what I mean here is um, there have to be some property rights protections and there has to be um, lower likelihood of reverse engineering and imitation. So skills have to be high enough, but also um, companies' competitive advantages have to be protected enough. Um, so for suppliers, again, the benefit to this, uh, engaging in this kind of technology transfer is new markets and profits. Um, for technology importers, it's making sure that the use of this new energy source is really sustained and being able to integrate it into a system and also higher skilled jobs and the revenues that come with that. Mm, so who's left out of flow B? Generally, yeah, countries with lower skilled workers or issues with property rights protections. Um, so as you can see, in the figures here, which are from IRENA, uh, the IRENA jobs database, most employment is still concentrated in a relatively small number of countries. Um, and uh, the potential solutions for this would be having some training and capacity building programs that are integrated with um, new installations, uh, possibly also some policy changes such as uh, low risk requirements for training and employment increasing property rights protections. This one's a bit controversial, but it's at least named uh, in the literature as this one way to deal with this. Um, all right, so flow C, where we get uh, technological capacity um, as knowledge and expertise are shared. Um, this is not happening in Jordan. I can, uh, in the case that I've been looking at, um, but it has been observed in the literature um, as happening um, in both the wind and solar industry in China. Um, so when are knowledge and expertise shared and why? So this is, um, this is possible if local firms have quite high absorptive capacities and also if they're engaged in these processes that require knowledge and expertise. So in China, this was um, manufacturing solar panels. Um, and for this, you need two things to happen. You need some kind of policy requirements basically and for this cooperation to benefit firms. So for the supplier um, engaging in technology transfer, they can still gain new markets and profit from this, but there's also the threat to competitive, competitive advantages here, having new competitors and perhaps losing the market share. Um, for importers, this has a lot of benefits. I mean, technological capacity, new industry and innovation, um, but, there's also a risk that if you enact policies to try to force, in air quotes, technology transfer, um, there's also uh, the possibility of trade conflicts or um, losing attractiveness for investors. Mm. So I'm going to go a little more in depth here on 
technology transfer policies um, and what we know about how they work. Um, so there are two that are really important. Um, the first is joint ventures. Um, so basically when foreign firms have to form a legal relationship um, and thereby transfer technology. So uh, in China, the way this works is there is a uh, something called the negative list, which is for important technologies, strategically important. Um, and there have to be uh, Chinese shareholders at 50% or above. Solar and wind energy used to be on this list while the industry was developing uh, until 2011. Um, electric vehicles have been on this list and are going to be phased out of it eventually. Um, but so this is a way of uh, pushing for technology transfer when foreign firms want to operate in China. Um, the other way is local content requirements, which you guys may know about because they're actually quite widespread. Um, what this says basically is that developers have to use a certain percentage of local products. Um, so if you're building a solar PV large installation in India, you have to use X amount of Indian made uh, solar panels. And this is a really common around the world. Um, and it's sometimes um, a requirement to build anything at all. Other times it's linked to funding. So for example, being eligible for feed-in tariffs, um, you have to use local, uh, local content. So the problem with local content requirements is that they don't always work to build industry. Um, I'm drawing on a paper here from Bazillion et al, um, but there's further research to support this. Um, so just zooming in on the, um, the example of India, um, there, there was this Make in India order in 2018, um, and in the end, uh, it can be kind of counterproductive in terms of um, how much it costs to actually install uh, energy, um, and also whether it even is successful in um, pushing firms to transfer their technologies. Um, yeah, so there's this efficiency issue of making installations more expensive. Um, there's also a potential trade conflict issue. Um, so local content requirements um, were one of the reasons that um, we see some conflicts at the World Trade Organization over um, yeah, inappropriate support of local industries violation of the uh, most favored nation uh, status. So, and also the reason that we have the, we had the um, tariff uh, solar tariffs uh, in the US that were, and in other countries as well. So um, what, why does all of this matter? Uh, why markets haven't been able to address the low carbon technology gap? Basically, um, what we take from this literature is the fact that countries that aren't China and aren't OECD countries don't necessarily have the economic and political clout to quote unquote force technology transfer. Um, so that's problem one. Problem two is that a lot of developing countries are not even included in streams A and B. So not there's not enough investment and there's not enough, um, let's say incentives to somehow transfer at least some skills alongside um, hardware. And so this is a problem because um, we've promised with the Paris Agreement to support countries to decarbonize their energy systems and nationally determined contributions are relying on that promise. Um, and there's also some risks of what happens when there's a more uneven energy transition, which I'll get to a bit later. Um, so what I did uh, was look at basically what are the other pathways, right? If we say that markets aren't probably going to address this to the extent that we need them to, what other options do we have? Um, and so for this, I did a, a qualitative mapping of the different kinds of initiatives that are um, transferring low carbon technology. So this included a literature review, then desktop research, um, stakeholder surveys, and then snowballing from that to understand who's working on this, what kinds of stuff are they doing, and where are they working. Um, and then the next step was to model the coverage of initiatives, so whether the number of initiatives operating in a given country could was correlated with technology gap vulnerability, which we measured as um, electricity market size, governance, and threats to competitive advantages, um, and then to different climate concerns. So this could be the carbon lock-in risks um, and the climate disaster risks. 
Mm. So what the initiatives mapping shows is that um, there are indeed a sort of a loose network of international organizations, development banks, and a few private actors um, working on technology transfer in different capacities. We see some examples of um, information sharing and training. Um, we also see some project finance that includes aspects of technology transfer. Um, so this, uh, yeah, as part of installation, as part of working on infrastructure um, and also smaller scale energy access initiatives. Um, they're often quite development focused. So working on getting people access who didn't have access already. Um, one thing that uh, is actively working on closing this um, innovation gap that we talked about is the climate innovation centers. Um, and these are all around support for um, small medium enterprises and emerging economies. Um, but given that I only found 71 initiatives that focus explicitly on technology transfer, it's clearly not um, quite enough to address this very significant gap. Um, so what the UNFCCC does, um, basically it's a main actor in this landscape. Um, and uh, the COP has delegated this to the technology executive committee, which is meant to provide guidance and provide roadmaps. Uh, for countries to help decarbonize. Um, and they also work on adaptation. What I'm focusing on here is mitigation, but um, that's another job that they have. Um, and so their sort of active arm is the Climate Tech Center and Network, the CTCN. Um, and this is the way that um, the UNFCCC really provides concrete technical assistance for developing countries. Um, however, again, a lot of this is actually um, helping, for example, countries to develop policies. So here on the right hand side, you can see an example, which is scaling up e-mobility and supporting sustainable infrastructure, um, which is not what I would call technology transfer per se. It's more policy advice, which is also relevant and important, um, but it's not what's going to close the technology gap. So, uh, and the other issue with this is that um, the entire technology mechanism is mostly financed by um, contributions that are coming from the international community, which are critically insufficient. Um, so the other thing that I found when I was looking at the initiatives that do, uh, that say that they transfer technology, many of them do, many of them focus on um, skills and capacity building. Um, however, a lot of them also focus on almost exclusively hardware transfer. So just putting some solar panels somewhere without a explicit skills and innovation support um, component. Um, most of the initiatives were public-private partnerships of some kind. Um, they did transfer lots of different kinds of technology. So they were focused not only on renewable energy generation, but maybe also on some small-scale storage um, or grid support. Um, as well as a lot uh, on energy efficiency. Um, and in general, um, the models show that they operate more often in countries with low electricity access, which really suggests that one of the main objectives of this kind of work is to actually address the sort of development gap. Um, and also in countries with uh, governance issues. Um, however, they, uh, when I, looked whether the number of initiatives per country correlates with climate risk, um, we actually see the, the opposite dynamic, which you would have expected, which is that countries that have a higher climate risk actually see fewer initiatives on average, um, which is a pretty um, problematic finding considering that one of the key country groups that the Paris Agreement um, is meant to support is countries with very high climate risks. Um, all right, I won't do that right now. So basically, what are the implications um, of this persistent technology gap that we're looking at? I mean, one of them is um, for global emissions. So right now, these initiatives are, or the market is not focusing on countries that have like lower rates of energy access and lower rates of emissions. Um, like for example, the clean development mechanism was quite focused on China. So that's good in the short term because we need to obviously decrease emissions. But in the long term, what's happening is that we see 
fossil fuel lock-in increasing in those regions where energy demand is going to increase um, dramatically in the next uh, in the next decades. Um, the other thing is that there are political implications um, to this technology gap. Um, a lot of the narratives around decarbonization have this link to green economic growth. There's an expectation that when we see um, energy systems change, we'll also see the same experience that China has had, um, but that may not be universal. Um, and so there are obviously domestic implications for this, but there's also international implications um, because technology transfer is one way that we're meant to make climate negotiations go forward. If there's a lack of tech transfer, we might see roadblocks in international negotiations. Um, and finally, um, there's a growing literature on the risks for late decarbonizers. So basically um, that there will be stranded assets in those countries that their goods might be less competitive on global markets. Um, so one of the things that we've been talking about in our group is the European border carbon adjustment mechanism. Um, and basically if you count embodied emissions in trade, um, goods that are coming from places where emissions are higher in the future will become less competitive over time. Um, so basically we need to do more than we're doing. Um, sorry, it's not a very uh, optimistic end to a lecture here, um, but I'm happy to talk a bit more about uh, any of these details and uh, hear what you guys think. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Sylvia. Um, I wonder if there are questions. If you have questions, you can either raise your hand, uh, type them in the chat, or use a question and answer tool. I will then moderate. Um, maybe I start with a question. It seems that you are favoring the technology transfer over the diffusion. Um, is there, um, let's say, is, is there also modeling uh, being done to, to assess this, whether actually this makes sense uh, in, in the climate change perspective, if actually the targets can be met better with transfer than with diffusion? Sure. Um, so I don't know of any modeling that looks specifically at the difference between diffusion and transfer. The reason that I'm talking about transfer is because, um, because the NDCs name technology transfer explicitly rather than diffusion. So basically um, not only, yeah, not only some kind of financial support, but also this tech transfer and capacity building, which are kind of a similar thing, but um, yes. Yeah, so I think there was modeling, um, from someone who looked at the relationships of like what will happen if NDCs, uh, conditional NDCs needs aren't met. Um, and it was a much higher emissions pathway. Mm. And obviously the existing NDC pathway is also not sufficient um, for climate change. So um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think that overall the NDCs will be met or is it like, that those are nice, uh, what, what's the name? Uh, nice proposals, but uh, that companies and uh, states uh, who own the technology are actually not really doing it or delay the, the process, so to say. Mm. I mean, I think, um, so there's, there's kind of two, different aspects to this. So I think in general, will the NDCs be met um, is kind of outside of my wheelhouse. Uh, I think no, but um, that's just based on what I know about, um, yeah, uh, international climate politics. Um, what I will say is that, um, yeah, uh, basically, I think the problem with the technology transfer literature and also the problem with the conditional NDCs is that it expects firms to act in a way that firms don't act, which is to say just give technology away, um, which they will not do unless they are required to do so, which is like why the example of China is interesting with the um, so-called forced technology transfer. I mean, that's like a 
bit of a problematic term, but I think it illustrates pretty well um, this relationship between yeah a technology supplier and an importer. Um, so yeah, I think without that kind of leverage, there's no there's very little interest in transferring technology rather than just diffusing technology. Um, so for me, one way to try to deal with this, um, to try to like work on this would be from the, um, yeah, from the developed country side, which would be, for example, um, under the World Trade Organization laws, there's meant to be specific support and um, there's meant to be uh, ways that developed countries promote technology transfer um, from their firms. Um, right now, all they have to do is report on that. They just have to say we did it um, and not go into a great degree of detail. Um, but there, some kind of like enforcement mechanism there could be helpful. Um, and otherwise, also, I think pressure from um, the societal actors. So like, I was talking about the example of Orsted and um, the wind turbines that they operate in Jordan. Um, and if the EU said, look, if you start building a wind technology, like if you start building a wind farm in another country, you need to provide like X amount of local training. Um, I think that would also be a start. Uh, yeah, so mm -hmm. long answer, but I see people have raised their hands now. So that's yeah. also good. Uh, oh moderate that now uh maybe just a follow-up question from my side uh, do you think then states should actually buy the technology and provide it instead of having the companies do the technology transfer say germany buys up technology it has and provides it for free uh, that the companies have in germany that it's mm -hmm. no longer in the in the private market so, so, so to say um so I think this is actually something that was discussed at one point at the UN was like making a fund to buy the technologies and put them in the public domain. Um, I think, I mean, there's a whole there's a whole conversation to be had about intellectual property rights and like the degree to which they actually block technology transfer um, versus yeah. Uh, but what I think is basically. Um, we need to differentiate between green industrialization also and technology transfer to the extent that it's needed. Because I think, um, for example, Germany buying all of the patents and making them publicly available um, would not necessarily be able to promote green industrialization, although it might promote some tech transfer. Um, so yeah, that's what I... <laughs> Uh, I, I don't think it's likely because, again, of the interest of um, people who own technology to keep it that way. Um, but it would be, yeah, it's one thing that people have uh, at least discussed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then uh, I'll get to the questions. Uh, first was Julie Desais. Uh, she's asking, I'm wondering about lack of information shared on technology transfers due to confidentiality. confidentiality. Could it actually bias your conclusions both negatively? Other actions are happening, but they are not reported. And positively, some actions are excessively highlighted for political and communicative reasons. In other words, what is your level of confidence considering confidentiality? Um. Thank you. I, I have to say um, my level of confidence is, uh, well, my level of confidence in the initiatives that I categorized as participating in technology transfer is relatively high because I read through reports and pages and pages of PDFs to say, like, what are they actually doing? Can we call this technology transfer or are they calling it transfer and it's really diffusion? So there, um, I feel confident that at least some transfer is taking place. Um, I think um, in terms of confidentiality and technology sharing, but not talking about technology sharing, um, this is actually something that I was thinking about because there were initiatives that said they couldn't disclose the like 
ownership structures. Um, and so it is possible that there's technology sharing going on within them. It is also possible that there's technology exploitation going on within them. Um, and I can't say for sure. Um, so I really only focused on those ones that I could confidently assess what was going on, maybe at the expense of um, losing some uh, nuance. Um, but I tried to focus on those ones where I was confident. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Yeah, you can't know what you can't know, right? <laughs> to some extent. Okay, uh, next is Subu, uh, who raised his hand. Hey, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Rainer. Uh, hi, Sylvia. Uh, sorry, I missed a, a, a half of your talk. Uh, it's like, but anyways, the uh, the one the one finding lot, lots of questions, but I think one key finding I think, uh, and maybe I missed your explanation for this, is that the countries that are at highest climate risk are also not getting a lot of technology transfer or diffusion, whatever it is, not getting the help that they may need. Uh, have you looked into why that is, or uh, do you have hypotheses of why that would be the case? Sure, yeah. So, um, I in the paper, I don't speak to why that is the case I, extensively. I think there are two possible reasons. Um, so, the first is generally that most of the initiatives that I identified were public-private partnerships, which means that at some level, market interests are involved. Um, I don't know the exact extent because again, public-private partnerships are often just a black box. You don't know who decides what and why and when. Um, I will say that we know um, now that companies are increasingly um, assessing climate risk when they make decisions. Um, about where they're going to invest. So I would expect that that would at least be a part of it um, or that could potentially be a part of it. Um, I think that there is a potential also for, um, yeah, uh, if my variable, because what I was looking at specifically was um, deaths per 100,000 um, because of climate disasters. Um, so I think it is also possible that some of that, what that variable captures is also um, just generally like if issues with infrastructure. Um, so there could be also some, some omitted variable that's in there. Um, I mean, I hope not, <laughs> but the alternative also isn't great. Um, so yeah, that would be, but again, this is, these are very, this is like rough averages. I was just kind of exploring and looking for patterns to see if I could find any. Um, but it's not necessarily, yeah, I don't want to say it's like the be all end all because it, I looked at 71 initiatives and the world is a big place. Um, so, yeah. Great. Uh, thanks. So I do have one more uh, quick question for, for my interest, which is, you know, mostly in air quality and air pollution. And, uh, you know, just thinking of, because you are classifying things, whether it's a clean technology transfer or diffusion, and if there might be initiatives, I'm thinking of in particular, uh, you know, LPG, for example, right? I mean, if somebody is, uh, you know, using, have you, uh, have you come across any cases of people uh, replacing household uh, solid fuel burning with LPG? And that is something that you would not classify as a clean, uh, a clean development mechanism because it's a fossil fuel replacing a bio, you know, biofuel, uh, but it has huge benefits on the, uh, indoor air pollution, uh, personal health angle. So yeah. what, where would that fall? <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I think that's, so that's something that I actually struggled with when I was trying to sort of set the parameters of looking at these different initiatives, because clearly there are a lot of initiatives that work on super important stuff like clean cooking. Um, for me, what I'm interested in is entire energy systems transformations. And I think, um, so I tried to say, okay, look, I'm just looking at these uh, at solar, wind, uh, energy efficiency, grid support, um, because I wanted to narrow it down somewhat. The world is, yeah, there are many initiatives that focus on um, air pollution. Um, and also to say, look, like uh, this is supposed to be the backbone of any kind of future energy system. Um, and so it has the biggest like bang for your buck, if that makes sense in terms of decarbonization. Um, yeah, I will say that there were um, 
when I was trying to figure out how to narrow it down, I was looking at um, air pollution and air quality stuff. And this is definitely something that um, other people are working on, also somebody at our institute. Um, so yeah, I think it's a cool topic, but I did not, I did not include those initiatives um, in this sample. Great, thank you. Okay, Vincent, please. Yeah, hello, Sylvia. Thanks for the talk. Very interesting. Uh, I was simply wondering about, uh, I mean, you talk about transfer of technology. Um, and I mean, so far, I mean, probably 75% of the emissions are the I mean, US, uh, Europe, uh, China, and a few others. And so at that stage, I mean, uh, do, do we really need to bother for, uh, I mean, uh, tech transfer transi of, uh, uh, to uh, low worst emitters in the end. And so the, the sort of a related question is, can we think that, because in the end, I mean, the, the, the highest emitters are those that, I mean, don't need to transfer technologies. They need to apply those technology to themselves and, uh, and, 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 I mean, massively embrace, I mean, the, the energy transition. And so can we think that, well, in a matter of, uh, if that was happening, mm -hmm that uh, the transfer would basically trip speed over to uh, lowest emitters, I mean, uh, as, as a matter of time. Uh, I'm here in, in Senegal and uh, I mean, could we simply transfer regular technology? I mean, I mean even more efficient uh, uh, fuel engines, for example, would be already something using existing technologies. So what I mean to say is, is it not something that's going to come, uh, but that the first effort that's really needed is for, uh, for the highest emitters to really sort of do that, that transition in their own case? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. I think, um, so yeah, for me, um, technology transfer is needed not only for the highest emitters, although it is really needed for the highest emitters, but those are the ones that have as you said already, the technologies and just need to apply them. Um, and the problem, uh, I think also is because I, when I am thinking about the energy transition, I'm thinking in about 2050. Um, and that's when today's very low emitters will be tomorrow's very high emitters. And we know from, from the carbon lock-in literature that it is anytime you take a step in the direction of a certain technology, there are so many, it, the, the lock-in is magnified by a hundred. So this is also why, for example, when I was looking at initiatives, I didn't necessarily look at those that were um, looking at, for example, um, increasing efficiency, but still focusing on fossil fuels. So like replacing coal with gas, because for me, that's still a lock-in and you're still increasing the emissions in the longer term. Um, so yeah, I think like, Yes, technology is trans transfer is needed across the board. Um, and but for me, the question is a lot about what are we going to see until 2050? And are um, developing countries going to be able to really move out of this sort of carbon lock in trap that's currently closing? Yeah. If I, if I can ask, I mean, uh, uh, Kaiko, just a quick thing. Um, I mean, for example, for the car industry, I mean, again, I mean, if you move uh, favorably, I mean, in Europe by, I don't know, hopefully 15 years, I mean, there's no longer going to be any more, uh, uh, I mean, a turbo engine sort of produced. And, and, and the cars that go to the south, you I know, mean, basically the cars that come from the north. And, uh, so what I mean to say is that the, the, the industry of, of those new technologies is going to change so much that that's probably that's not going to be even more, uh, I mean, the technology available anymore that use, uh, that use fossil fuel. So in other words, I mean, the transition is, is somehow going to be become, I mean, I, I, it's, it's what you say, I mean, of looking at 2050 and, uh, and the lock-ins, it's, 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 it's a good point, of course, but uh, but we've got to consider that the whole industry around, I mean, uh, new energy is going to be like probably transiting and, and changing so much that uh, those old technology, well, that's what we can hope for, will not even exist anymore. Well, maybe that's a dream. I don't know. I, it's a great dream. No, I, I like on the one hand, I do, I do agree with you that in certain contexts and certain conditions, like technology spillover happens quickly and. 
unpredictably, but I think my focus in this work has really been on, um, yeah, on the avoidance of carbon lock-in, and that is just like a, a longer term, um, a longer term issue. But I think that's also, yeah, um, what we can see from um, the existing work on decarbonization and barriers to decarbonization is that prices don't necessarily result in technological diffusion. Um, so even though solar panels are quite cheap, are they actually being installed um, everywhere? No, <laughs> not necessarily. Um, and so I think m most places are going to need more than um, technologies becoming cheaper to actually sort of also recalibrate the kind of political economy that comes around, around these technological choices. Um, yeah, but I mean, it's, uh, it's a huge problem with so many different parts. And I think also, my issue in this paper was trying to find the part that I should focus on. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, while like acknowledging that all these other things are also happening at the same time, you know? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, maybe if I, if I also comment on that, if, if you think about the car producers in the north no longer producing uh, combustion engines, then and, and the south or the developing com, uh, countries having no infrastructure to run them, then someone will still produce combustion engines and will provide them and the south will continue to, or the developing countries will continue to use them. So somehow um, not transferring the, only hoping that because some people somewhere only electric cars are produced that they are used everywhere in the world, that, that doesn't that doesn't compute for me, at least. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No. Totally agree. Like, I mean, I don't know. I'm not a complete expert in nuclear technology, but like, we've had that technology for a very long time. Does it exist everywhere? No, because it's quite expensive and technologically complex to like build those energy systems. And so, like, we don't. We haven't seen technology uh, transfer and diffusion around the world, even though it would be technically possible. So, I think, yeah, there. Are, um, yeah, because the technology exists doesn't mean it moves from, from A to B, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Um, I see there's another, okay, that was just a, a comment by Vincent. I don't know if I, yeah, I might ask this question. So we see this uh, uh, awful war uh, in the Ukraine and uh, the impact on uh, energy prices and our energy security also in Europe and all that. What, what do you think, how, how does that affect also the uh, uh, renewable energies market? Uh, I wish Andreas were here because he could answer this question better than I could. Um, and I don't know, honestly, like I've been reading mostly other people's takes on Twitter. Um, I will say, because I looked into a bit, um, uh, into the dynamics of crisis and transitions when, when COVID hit. Um, and the short-term impacts are often that um, governments have less money to spend on, um, on things that they deem less important than security. Um, and so often climate plans go by the wayside um, because budgets are limited. Um, so I think it's not great news um, for the energy transition around the world. That said, I also think that a lot of changes to structures in energy systems happen when there are energy security concerns. Um, we saw this um, at different times, I think in the, the 1970s, um, there was this huge wave of research um, and work on how can we um, increase our energy efficiency, uh, work better and be less dependent on other countries. Um, and so I think there is the possibility that we will see more focus on renewables because they are seen as promoting um, security in terms of being able to produce your own energy locally rather than being dependent on uh, fossil fuel producers elsewhere. So I think it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a push and a pull. 
Um, I think that there's the potential for uh, speeding up the transition because of security concerns and um, limited funding is always bad news for sustainability. So I don't know, um, but uh, Vincent says, Yes, exactly. It, 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 yeah, the, the, the money that Germany will pull, push into defense will be taken from elsewhere. Um, so yeah, not being an expert in these things, that's my take. But um, Andre, if you follow Andreas on Twitter, he has a lot of commentary on this that's uh, more detailed. So.